this afternoon. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you so much, Heather, for having me. Um, today I'm going to share a story, my own story, but also be able to talk through um, this field and this work around sport for development and peace. Um, so I'm going to try to tie some different things together here. But I guess really I wanted to, um, I received a note about being able to incorporate just sort of my journey into this and the field of sport for development. And so I guess I wanted to be able to share how I got inspired to do this kind of work. But also, I think it actually in some ways ties in to what the broader sport for development and power sport movement kind of stands for and what it's about. So um, I think I may be like sort of a case study. Um, but I wanted to do that um, by kind of going through some different parts, um, being able to touch on some human rights aspects, disability, inclusion, um, but also get into broader um, kind of human rights, <laughs> sport for development. Um, I'm going to incorporate some media. Um, but really, it centers around these questions. So that, that's kind of my, my discourse today, or the conversation we'll have. And I really don't want to talk for too long, because I really want it to be more of a question and answer, and comments, and discussion. Um, so for me, the two questions that I was posing um, for us to answer today, and for me to share some of my thoughts, and then to see how you all think as well, is what is at the root of the power of sport, and what is at the core of sport for development and peace? So I just wanted to be able to um, to share a definition, just to start us off in terms of what, how would you define sport for development and peace? And so the intentional use of sport is back to being played to attain specific development objectives in low and middle income countries and disadvantaged communities in high income settings. So really thinking about how this sport for development framework actually applies worldwide. And then just a little bit of a note about the, the reference. There's the first journal of sport for development, actually, that's been in the works for a couple of years. That will be um, coming out with its first edition, um, actually, in the next few days, next week, I believe. So this just is a framework for thinking about sport for development. And I, would, I would draw your attention to thinking about the intentionality that we put into putting the programs into place. So then just to tie it into um, my story, to try to think about you know, how do we get from sport for development to thinking about its roots and its core, I just want to make sure that we really are thinking about and have an understanding that, that sport for development didn't just start in 2004 when there was kind of the UN Office of Sport and other declarations <coughs> that were put into place. Um, really, it's important to think about historically, put into context, of thinking about marginalized groups and who has not who has not been included, who's been on the margins. And I guess, you know, when I see this image, it actually it's obviously very powerful to think about how our societies could be a, a place like that. Um, you know, even as recently as the, you know, only 40, 50 years ago, is that kind of a, a norm in our society. Um, and so for me, you know, in my journey as an athlete, having been involved with the Paralympic Games and as an athlete with a disability, there were often times um, where you'd feel like, as an athlete with a disability, you were going into the colored fountain. Um, or if you, you know, were, you'd see the, the Olympians, you'd see the resources and the opportunities for able-bodied athletes, and then you would see um, what would happen for athletes with disabilities. Um, the, the first time that I competed in the Olympics or the Paralympics, I remember when we came in the bus, we were driving into the village, and uh, I just re I remember very vividly, like four or five of the sponsors. Um, the one that I remember the most was McDonald's. Like McDonald's truck was like driving away, <laughs> you know. And so for some reason, I just remember that, you know, was that a good thing or a bad thing or whatever? But it was the fact that a sponsor. I'm actually, I'm actually now looking back, actually glad that McDonald's is driving away because I don't think I want McDonald's or Coke to be a sponsor of the Olympics. 
But, uh, but still, the idea that the infrastructure that supported the Olympics was kind of being deconstructed, and it was a whole different ballgame for the um, Paralympics and athletes with disabilities. So for me, when I started to kind of think about those questions, and it really you know, it kind of ties back to younger ages, um, my family growing up, they would always emphasize sort of three pillars. One was academics, the other was sports, and the third was service or community engagement. Those were sort of the three things that I remember being very much ingrained in me at a young age. And, um, and so for me, when I did service work um, at a young age, I, when I was 12, I went to a Special Olympics event, and um, I was volunteering with the track and the soccer. And I remember just really being also confounded by some of the social justice issues there about you know, what's so special about Special Olympics, and you know, what I felt like there was some paternalism and sort of more of a charity model. Um, and those things have now evolved. Um, and, but at the time, I remember just feeling a sense of like social justice, but I didn't know the word. I didn't know what it meant. I just remember thinking about what equality meant. And again, not only for disability, but for uh, any group. And then I remember um, in college at some point, I, I came across um, this definition here that talks about you know, creating a vision for society and a place that is safe and secure. And um, you know, for me, being able to have a context or a definition of what I was experiencing and what the world was like and what we were up against, um, but also to say that there's possibilities for what can be done, that work that's been done around race and gender and LGBT sexual orientation and other groups in sport, that there is a, there is a pathway. Um, but for me, I remember in the, one of the courses that I took um, that really inspired me was a course, um, a sports and social issues course, when I was a student at Brown, that uh, didn't have a single mention, there wasn't a single chapter, a single word in the book about athletes with disabilities um, or any of the issues that presented around that. So social justice <coughs> in the book and the text was defined in a certain way, but it was invisible to people with disabilities. So that was sort of a, a trigger. Um, for me, as part of what I'll share today is some of the um, sort of the messages or the quotes or the, the images that have stuck with me. And so this one is obviously very powerful. It's tied into that, connected to the social justice framework has been the human rights framework. And um, only through um, having the opportunity to work internationally with the United Nations on the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, did I start to realize that, um, I started to make those connections between sports and social justice and human rights. I guess, you know, I had a sense that there was something wrong that people with disabilities were not being included. I had a sense there was something wrong when other groups were not being accessed, were not being granted access to the opportunity. But I didn't necessarily have a framework or a way to think about the fact that sport itself was part of this kind of human rights promise. And so I remember coming across this and, and really just being inspired by the fact that this actually gives me purpose to the work you know, that I'm interested in. And, and really thinking about like, how is this kind of foundational? How is this core? How, how are social justice and human rights actually really central to the power of sport and to that conversation? So the first time that I actually saw anything written about disability and people with disabilities in sport was um, um, Karen DePaul's work, um, who wrote a book on disability in sport. But you know, as a, I was just as you kind of are finding new areas and new topics, you come across books, you come across authors, in fact, you people that inspire you, and. Um, you know, for me, Karen DePaul, I, was, I reached out to her, you know, and then I saw this book, I was like, I gotta get in touch, because something about this phrase here was like really interesting to me. I'd never seen it before, and I was like really inspired by the fact that someone would actually think about disability and people with disabilities in this way, both in society but also in sports. Um, and so this whole idea of thinking about invisibility, <coughs> that it's that it's visible, 
but it's also invisible because it just becomes so normal and it becomes such a part of who the society is that it, that it doesn't become, it becomes invisible. So at, at first it may be invisible because of ignorance or exclusion, and then you create that awareness, but then it becomes invisible again, because, but, but not from a place of exclusion, it becomes invisible from a place of um, acceptance. And so I think that, um, you know, way that you framed it, and again, that similarly around disability to, um, to contribute to the discourse about the term disability, and uh, how do you think about that? And that, that was very powerful for me. This also kind of was part of my kind of framing and understanding and thinking about how do I, myself, but also as a society, how, we, how do we begin to um, think about people with disabilities in the context of sports? But really, it's disability is just a lens, so it's really not even about disability, it's about you know, the um, gender or race or other um, groups at the margins that we may be trying to figure out how to include, how to create development, how to take the most out of society. You know, part of it is like, what's the, what, are, what pair of glasses are we wearing? You know, how are we actually seeing a resource? Do we see it as a, as a positive resource? Or do we see it as like, oh, this is going to be a drain? And so, you know, for me, from the perspective of disability, you know, being able to think about disability as an art form, you know, I had never even had thought about it like that. But to then begin to think about this, there's actually an innovative aspect. There's actually all the creative, you know, products and designs and the way people with disabilities actually go through the world that is very much <coughs> ingenious. But there's actually some really, you know, someone could make a million dollars out of some invention that comes out of the disability community. So I wanted to share just a couple quick videos to kind of put some more context in terms of this kind of reframing or how do we think about um, the human condition and disability and, and how is it emerging, particularly from a sports standpoint. So I'm going to start with this one. This kind of soccer is played by a group of physically challenged people, sitting on locally made skate sports. A large proportion of the people we have were born in Kumi. Why is that not a I can't talk saying I'm not a beggar. I'm a beggar. Because I don't have anybody who will give me. So I have to go a beggar. Going inside the class, very dangerous. A car knocked one of them some time ago. The car passed on the right flight. The wood falling like this. This one was piercing through his flesh. The sun is with three or four, one more. One sir, and I want to be able I live in the tent near yeah, my wife and my daughter in the same place. The objective is to get them off the streets, become popular stars, take care of their families so that they don't have to always be here. Because I'm not tomorrow morning Sunday, I'm going to play all. 
The moment I don't have anything, I know even now, right now, you drop the ball, I can play. Yeah, it's so that. Yeah. I like to play for Ghana, to be a Ghana player. That is what I'm thinking all the day. I thank God for creating me like this. to share some media kind of this is an upcoming you know the rolling ball is an upcoming movie that's in the works so I wanted to just sort of given what I've just spoken about be able to share kind of the media that's starting to come out with regard to disability in sports and so I wanted to be able to share the London promotional start again so this is a, a promotional from London around uh, the Olympics and Paralympics Come on, guys! Get back to the men's line! Do the show! Sort of sequence that I wanted to show is um, coming up just just this past summer, or um, sorry, not summer, the past past couple of months. A sort of follow up from the summer, we um, my colleagues and I we we launched a, a a campaign called How Cool Is That, and basically wanted to try to get people's reactions to their um, interest in watching athletes with disabilities and. <coughs> Support and disability and development. Um, and so we, we put a call out for people to just produce um, you know, homemade, small videos. That's sort of like a call to action to also try to inspire more media coverage because um, there are some media coverage globally, but you know, there's not a lot. You can't really go onto the um, you know, most sports channels and find coverage of athletes with disabilities. So part of it was to try to inspire um, various media outlets and just the community itself to really think about the power of sport and people with disabilities and what, what's possible. Um, and so we had about um, 10 submissions and uh, we narrowed it down to two and uh, we had a group of people review the videos and um, so this is the winner of the, the contest. Welcome home to a movement that shows what sport is all about. Sport is about what you can do, what you can achieve, the limits you can reach, the barriers you can break. Sport shows what is possible. 
sport refuses to take no for an answer. And everything sport stands for, we're going to see right here, right now. students that created a uh, production um, and they actually have a documentary coming out this summer. They traveled across the country in a bus and um, they met different programs around the country and it's called Endless Abilities. Um, so you'll probably see that. You know, it's more of an independent film but you'll, you'll be out there. So I got to give a little bit of context to the, my journey on the disability side of things. And then I wanted to transition to looking at another kind of important dimension of the sport for development arena that has also had a big impact on me. For me, as I was beginning to kind of understand and learn about the broader notions of sport and the power of sport, um, I had had sort of an initial focus on the disability arena, but then through the opportunity of, of, uh, of learning about this philosophy called Olympism, I began to then think about, well, there's other dimensions of um, what happens with the power of sport and how sport can have an effect. Um, I'll just do a quick poll. How many of you have heard of Olympism before this moment? A few. So Olympism is a part of the Olympic Charter, and it, it really is part of the founding principles of the, of the games. Um, the found, modern founder of the games, Pierre de Coubertin, part of his um, uh, formation of the modern games was also based on an educational pedagogy that he developed um, around Olympism. And it's actually interesting because there's kind of the interpretation of it given a, a particular point of time. And so, you know, there's a modern interpretation, which is kind of where I come from. And then, but if you actually think about, like, how would you interpret Olympism if you were in, you know, 1950 or 1930? So it's important to think about kind of what point of time you're in. And for me, in terms of how I was initially looking at it, in terms of thinking about um, inclusion and human rights and so forth, that this was one of the first kind of holistic philosophies that I felt kind of just spoke to me as a, as a person. And, um, and to me, it really spoke a lot about and raised questions for me about what, you know, what does this actually say about disability? And so for me, this is actually you know, part, of my, part of my continued work, ongoing work, and my focus um, is to really look at this formation of Olympism and how it relates back to disability. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how these two go hand in hand. But I also think it's important, more broadly, that how it just relates to the sport for development movement. And really, it is this educational philosophy about good example, social responsibility, respect for ethical principles. But then if you look at the second part of it, I thought really related to some of the human rights work in these essence, and also thinking about the sport for development movement at the level of peace building, 
uh, Olympism really speaks to that. And so that when I first saw you know, this idea of sport as a human right within the Olympic Charter, kind of going back to that earlier definition, it made me think about well, what is that connection between the Olympic movement and the human rights movement? You know, what's kind of at the core of that? And so as I began to kind of look at the Olympic frameworks and the Olympic language, particularly at the, the level of the, of the charter and of the symbols and of the mottos, it really did raise some questions for me about who is, who is in the Olympics and who's not in the Olympics. And not only the games itself, not only the, or the games times, but more about the broader <coughs> movement of kind of who's included and who's not. And I remember I, I shared a moment ago that I'm sharing with you some of the quotes and the messages that really kind of stuck with me and you know kind of light the fire under me to keep going with the work that I do. And I remember in 2008 I, I saw in an interview um, the president of the IOC, Jacques Rogue, he, he made this comment about the Olympic rings and how it belongs to everyone. It's a striking symbol and it's an expression of, so you know, it's kind of a sweeping statement about the Olympic rings and who, who identifies and given the philosophy of Olympism it makes a lot of sense um, but still I also know that I'm not allowed to use the Olympic rings officially I do identify as an Olympian and I, I utilize the Olympic rings because of the philosophy that we just talked about but at an official level the Olympic rings do not belong to everybody so I wanted to share just some ways of thinking about the connection between Olymp Olympism. Let me find the video again. Here it is. This was a video that was done in the lead up to the uh, the bid for the Chicago Games. And the Chicago Games put together this promotional video. What's the difference between an Olympian and a Paralympian? It's the same floor, the same room, the same ball. It's the same passion, the same dedication, the same amount of sweat, the same amount of pain. So, I just like to pose this question about, you know, we have Olympians, we have Paralympians, you know, why, why don't we call the female athletes femme Olympians, female Olympians? You know, and so it raises that question about why do we call the Paralympians? You know, and so I think that's part of the, this link between this broader philosophy and the words that we choose and the power of those words. and. Um, you know, I believe that that's, that's part of my interest and in my investigation is as you begin to look at the root of the power of sport and sport for development, you know, some things are, you know, how is it being powerful? Is it, being, is it powerful in a, in a, um, from the framework of empowerment? Or is it powerful because it's like inspired resistance and inspired a need to actually um, challenge the paradigm? And I would say in some cases, the sport for development movement and the, and the power of sport is actually rooted in this notion of having to resist. And so just to, uh, in terms of building on this notion of the relationship between Olympism and, and all groups, not only disability, but if you look at the model that's done in soccer with FIFA, they have the men's, the women's World Cup and the men's, and they're all under the same framework or the same movement. So in terms of thinking about 
um, particularly the relationship between the Olympics and the Paralympics. It's not to say that everything has to be in one games. It could be that there's still the two games, but it's more of a one movement. And I think you see that sort of happening. It's evolving in that way, and so that's, that's really positive. And so kind of being able to think through kind of what is, you know, what does that do? The one movement idea is that um, how does that actually link back to the power of sport and sport for development? And so for me, that's, that's, that's that kind of discourse I just walked through, Olympism and, and so forth, is the work that I'm doing on my dissertation. And so I'm trying to really unpack kind of, you know, what are the benefits, what are the challenges, how does that work? Um, where are the resistance points? I'm doing some interviews with Olympians and Paralympians to uh, get their sense of, um, you know, how do they look at the symbols? How do they look at the language? You know, how, what kind of effect does that have on them? And so the last part of kind of the remarks that I wanted to share today um, before kind of wrapping up with some perspective on um, kind of answering the first question I posed at the beginning is I really I wanted to share the story um, of, of this quote um, that really had a powerful effect on me because I was very resistant to thinking about myself as an activist for whatever reason. I think I, I thought activism um, meant you know, marching in the streets, activism meant you know, um, doing political protests. For me, I hadn't ever thought about activism as more of just like a way of life. I hadn't thought about activism as kind of a perspective and not necessarily a, a particular tactic. And I was in, there's a couple slides, so I'll kind of scroll through them. It's a, you know, I tried to bold some of the well, aspects of it. For me, I, um, I, was, I got called by a colleague who I've now kind of worked on a few things with, who was doing interviews with athlete activists, who um, he asked me if I, you know, I could talk with him and about athletes and activism and what I had done in my work and how I identify. And I told him I, I was an educator, you know, I was, you know, I was a, um, a coalition, I used all these other words, you know, I was a coalition organizer, I was, you know, I like to mobilize, it was, you know, fun to work with people. Um, I didn't want to use the term activist because I thought that, it, I think I said it was a, um, it was like a flaming word. I said, you know, to be an activist is like flaming hot, like, you know. Um, and so I, then he said, like, you know, a couple a week later or something, he sent me this to kind of help me think about activism more. And, um, and then that, that kind of line of conversation really got me thinking about this whole community of athletes involved with activism. So to me, you know, the whole idea of you know, being able to create, I guess the very last part about how kind of tying time back to social justice in terms of creating a vision or the world that you want to live in, but in terms of how you're doing it, that it's not about the tactics. It's actually about the spirit and the heart and the way that you're living your life. <coughs> so for me, you know, sort of tied in to my, um, my mentor um, from Northeastern at the center was Dr. Richard Lapchik, who started the center. And um, I remember he also shared his perspective about leadership and about athletes and about what it means to stand up for justice and um, so I just thought I would, this, when he said this, I remember seeing an interview and I, I, you know, when I'm talking about leadership and things like that, it just, it really strikes home for me because it's not only about standing up, it's also about, about, you know, not blocking his path. And so I, you know, love to hear your thoughts on how you interpret that. And so for me, this idea of athletes engaging in sport for development, in human rights, in the power of sport, and kind of what that means and how they identify with this movement. And so for me, I had, um, you know, I tying into the kind of the creativity <coughs> side of the center here and kind of expression um, and how do, how do you kind of give your, how do you share your voice <coughs> and how do you collaborate with others? Um, you know, I, over the last several years, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, how, 
How do I work with other athletes? How do I um, both work to, with other athletes to create a space that's safe for athlete activists, but also a place that's supportive across different issues? But also, I was really interested in like, how do I find my own voice? Um, one of the ways that you know, I always keep a journal, I, I like to express myself um, in kind of both through writing and drawing. And, um, and I was asked to kind of talk a couple months ago about the you know, next generation, you know, the future leaders in sport for development. And I, I just remember, I, I, uh, I just jotted this down, you know, kind of, kind of trying to tie in a lot of these things together, but also in terms of what is that next generation looking like. Um, and so for me, it's about being, being present, having a voice, you know, um, there's, especially with social media now, with an opportunity to, um, you know, kind of share ideas and to be able to express, and not necessarily to hide in darkness, or not necessarily to um, be silenced, although there is that pressure, and there are times where it's not as easy to speak up. But I think that part of the next generation is really important. So, um, so I wrote this, you know, why should I hide in darkness when I am brilliant and beautiful? Why can't I? triumph and struggle in public. Why can't I laugh or cry for all to see? I am the young light. And so, I know we heard before, like, one of the <laughs> videos talked about being beautiful. I think the sport doesn't care video, that like, you are powerful, you are beautiful. Um, so that kind of message, I think, is important. <coughs> and then I did want to also share, you know, over the last several weeks, so this is a more recent initiative, um, in terms of working with this coalition of athlete activists and the organizations, one of the things that we recognize is that there's a lot of initiatives that are um, on a specific topic, so like the LGBT community creating an ally movement around um, straight and LGBT community coming together, or there's an initiative called the End the Honor Word, which is to um, empower people to rethink the word retard in schools and so forth, and to empower those without disabilities to support that cause. But in terms of an overarching kind of athlete pledge, or an overarching kind of thinking about solidarity and um, being an ally, not only to your own movement, but to other movements, um, we've, we've uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we drafted this sort of statement. And then we actually set up a, uh, a, a sign, a pledge on a petition site. So on, on change.org, there's a petition site. So we, just to get signage to see how many signages we could get. And it was, we were actually having lunch, and I got a note that Billie Jean King signed the pledge just today. And uh, Billie Jean King, obviously, is the one who paved the way a lot for women in sport. And so that was obviously a very surreal moment, just like, you know, while we were having lunch. Um, but this whole idea of, you know, who is speaking up, where are the voices, solidarity, ally, um, and then one voice, one world, one team. So again, to really think about that as a platform, but also a way to, to sign on to something. So I wanted to be able to just talk about the athlete movement um, and kind of where, where that is headed. Um, at the end of March, we have a forum at the Muhammad Ali Center um, on athlete activism. And uh, so trying to continue to coalesce kind of where we're thinking about the role of the athletes and how our athletes what are the forces upon them, the powers that are either um, enhancing their movement or detracting? So just to kind of in closing, I wanted to um, share just a couple thoughts in terms of the, going back to the original question of the power of <coughs> sport and sport for development, what's, what's at the root? And so again, I'm, you know, I've obviously covered a lot of things, and, but I, at one point, I sort of talked about the essence, which I think is about um, going from dark to light. I think that aspect of um, you know how do you how do you take a situation of despair or challenge, and how do you then move that to a um, a source of empowerment? And so this is obvious, this is a very famous Nelson Mandela quote, where he talks about the power of sport, and his last sentence is sport can create hope where once there was despair. 
Another aspect of the Olympic movement is um, the Olympic Creed, which not, not many people know about the Olympic Creed, which is one of the, uh, one of the symbolic kind of uh, dimensions of the, Olymp of the uh, charter that Pierre de Coubertin put together. And again, he refers to not only to win, but it's also about the struggle. It's not only to have conquered, but to have fought well. So it's about the journey. And um, so I think that to really think about where, how you're coming from struggle to then where do you go from there. So I just have this one last video. And then just a couple other little things. And then I want to open it up. I wanted to share just kind of a video that really spoke directly to the sport development. Um, and also to tie in a little bit more of the media and, the, and where a corporation like Nike would, would contribute. Basically, it's kind of thinking about the fact that the sport for development movement and the power of sport doesn't really exist without some sort of injustice at the core, without some sort of um, struggle or that need to repair. So being able to tie these things together, the power of sport actually really emerges from the ability to see um, you know, some kind of challenge that you're addressing. And so the video talks about kicking racism's ass and sexism and you know that there's, there's an issue there there's something that you know that really drives the movement you know this the power of sport when you see a when you see sport in a moment um, that really takes hold um, I think there's a there's a case to be made for the fact that it comes out of this rights from wrongs approach so if I were to kind of you know kind of put together a power of sport DNA you know, if you're really to look at kind of what is at the root of sport for development and the power of sport. Again, I think it is around this tension. It's not that it's like one happens and it's automatically going to happen. I think there's, there's something there. And so in that mix of the struggle, the injustice, the repair, the inequality, you know, the discrimination, the things that are driving the, this power of sport and the sport for development movement to happen, there is this um, ability for then um, for the 
for the sport for development movement to then find the, the friendship, the love, the joy, the respect, the <laughs> dignity, the community building. So all of those things actually emerge into what we see as a sport for development movement. But if you, if you kind of are really looking for the nut, if you're looking for that, um, the core of what this is all about, I just think from a historical standpoint, from, from really getting a sense of where this comes from, and again, kind of speaking at a personal level, like I said at the beginning, um, you know, I don't know from my perspective if I would be doing this type of work if it didn't actually come out of an, a, a place of injustice or a place of struggle. You know, and so I, I think that's just important to realize that as we're kind of, you know, the folks in the community and as we grow and as we continue to move, in terms of how do we identify the power of sport and what's a big source of moving this forward is to actually be aware of the, the problems we're addressing, the injustice, because that is actually a source of that inspiration for what will allow the movement to continue to, to flourish. You know, so I think um, you know, that, that's sort of the, the thoughts that I wanted to share today and to try to make that case and to make that conversation um, kind of open. As we as we kind of talk about it together, so, so thank you so much for you know kind of listening to me to ramble on here. And, uh, but I'd love to really open it up for discussion, and sharing. Yeah. Um, I'm Susan Birch. Thank you. It's as as somebody who has a disability and who's interested in disability activism and scholarship, it's refreshing to have more voices of this college be explicit about these issues. So I thank you very much for, for coming and sharing. I guess one of the productive tensions between critical disability scholarship and disability sport is that issue of inspiration. And the importance of inspiration in sport as a, as a key value. But when applied to, to bodies and minds that are labeled disabled, usually inspiration is the mechanism to avoid social critique. So a person overcomes their disability to become a valid human being in the world. And so I'm wondering, how do you, how do you tackle what is inherent in sport and beautiful about sport <coughs> and a problem of cultural framework that is damaging and silencing and oppressing for people with disabilities? That's a really good question. I think um, well, that's a really it's a really important conversation. It's also really important to um, for the athlete community, to, especially these last, you know, in concert with this movement too, kind of thinking about the power of sport and how sport does have this effect. I think it really has helped the disability community, the disability sport community, think about what inspiration means. Because if you know, if we look at athletes in general, you know, look at um, you know athletes without disabilities and Olympic athletes and how they serve as a source of inspiration. Um, you know, I think that the one thing that I found from a human rights framework that was really helpful is to kind of be able to distinguish different types of inspiration, you know, to try to kind of um, unpack it a little bit and sort of look at, um, you know, where, where is this inspiration coming from? You know, how genuine or how um, legitimate is the environment that is, that is um, you know, putting together the package around this athlete? And how, what voices that athlete have in there? So, in some ways, in some situations, I've seen, a, you know, athletes really feel great about being an inspiration, and really feel like, you know, what they accomplished was inspirational, and being a role model, and being out there for any kid or any adult, with or without a disability. But then there's also, I mean, for me, I, as an athlete, I can speak from my own experience that, you know, I would every media interview and every time I talk to my own parents and. You know, I, mean, I would just really resist any type of association being an inspiration. But, um, and I do think that in many cases, and we see them, we actually just did a piece around um, challenging like what is inclusion, because sometimes an inclusion experience will be coming from a source of, of pity or charity um, that's oftentimes more um, sensationalized when, you know, to create an empowering moment or an empowering experience is sometimes more of a long term. So it's not just you go in for you know one play, one at the end of the game, but actually you're a part of the team, you're you know, um, you're able to really be a part of it. And so I think part of it is just seeing the environment. And so I would say the human rights approach, but also you know I've learned a lot from the kind of the universal design 
aspects, which also I think apply beyond disability. It's like how do you create an environment that's inclusive for anybody, whether you have a disability or not. And, um, you know, because sometimes a, an environment or a, or can be stigmatizing for for people that are um, for racial backgrounds or sexuality backgrounds or gender or religion. And so I think oftentimes it's like sometimes it's the things that aren't said. You know, and so I think it's how do we create an environment that really is genuinely inclusive? And so, but I think the disability actually is a gateway. It's a good way to kind of think about these questions for anybody. But um, yeah, no, it's it's definitely a big topic, and it um, it ties in a lot of pieces around like you know different types of disabilities and how each one's represented. And so, in some ways, the inspiration questions is also kind of very central to this conversation. So thank you. Yeah. Um, I like the U.S. soccer. U.S. soccer. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering if you could just explain a little bit more about <coughs> what you do because um, it seems you know I'm watching that that ad you know it calls upon every athlete to to sort of make a difference and I feel as though university athletics are particularly geared towards, you know, potentially addressing social change because of the resources, the motivated base, and so forth, uh, especially Division Three, I think. Um, and it seems like Brown might be doing something that everybody else isn't, so I thought you might speak to that. I think part of it is to create um, opportunities, a safe space, or uh, actually even start the conversation for athletic departments because of the divide between athletics and academics. You know, sometimes it's like, you know, athletics is just doing this thing over here. And then, you know, it's a little bit different for D3 and so forth. But I do think there is still some of the just sort of more mainstream um, kind of what is sport. And so I think part of it is to be able to, again, create that space for athletes to be able to, for athletes, coaches, administrators, to actually embrace this kind of different, you know, I talked about the pair of glasses, you know, like how do you actually see a full range of sports potential um, and kind of what it can do for the community, the campus. Um, it's not only what happens on the playing field, but it's also, you know, there's a lot of other ways that you know, the athletes can kind of think about their skill sets and grow and connect it to their academic work. Um, so at Brown, basically, we have you know, a laboratory of you know, athletes. We also have developed like a student initiative, like a student club. Um, so um, not athletes and the general general students can kind of be a part of this club to um, organize awareness raising events, can organize community activities, can you know write reports, can you know reach out to different sectors. Um, so I think that component of having a, a, a framework of having faculty, of having staff, having coaches that are committed, having a course. I think have, you know we've had a couple of courses that have developed um, one course, one way to develop courses at Brown, which I think is most places is like independent study or group independent study where students can kind of come together, work with the faculty, have a topic. And um, so the group independent study model is also very good because the students can kind of lead their own knowledge building in terms of, um, but I would say um, a big part of it is just creating a, a space, creating a community that, um, that kind of gives permission. Um, we, you know, I think there's also fellowship, you know, fellowship help. You know, if you can give a student you know, a couple thousand dollars to do a project or to work, you know, to kind of help to give them structure to tie it into a course and engage scholarship, um, you know, work with a faculty member. So I think the fellowship model is also very useful. We've, you know, utilized, but um, I, you know, part of it is that because of this movement is growing, you know, it's and like like I mentioned at the outset, you know, there's this journal coming out, you know, the things are happening, and so it's a great time for um, you know campuses to um, you know mobilize on this topic because you know sports studies and these things are have sometimes been seen as like not serious enough, you know, staff and faculty sometimes like hide it on the resume. And so I think part of it is actually to embrace this area as, a, as an interesting area of study and, um, you know, in the same way that you can study all sorts of things, that this is one place that, um, you know, good work can be done. It's an emerging field. Um, it's interdisciplinary. 
And so I, I, so I think if more campuses can develop the sport studies or sport development study, you know, interdisciplinary initiatives, then it really helps. Um, and I think that, that in some ways that helps to bridge the gap between academics and athletics. Um, and you know, I think that in many ways, if, from a college sports standpoint, I think it could actually help help a lot to rethink that tension between academics and athletics. So, I don't know if that sort of answers the question. I think it's it's just about starting, you know, creating a space and uh, trying to you know inspire, you know, inspire, you know, get people to feel like this is something that you can do. You know. Do you have a website for? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just the brown, you know, sport and development project. Yeah.